Hey, glad you guys are here. We're continuing our series called Ablaze. Um, you guys are probably aware that the opening ceremonies for the Summer Olympics took place in, you know what? Pause. I, I'm messing up right now. I'm supposed to be telling you something different. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, what I was supposed to remember is that our students just got back from houseboats. Um, yeah. Pastor Nick was about to have another reason to be upset with me. Um, our students just got back from houseboats, an amazing week up at Lake Shasta. They had 115 students go to houseboats with them. Um, yeah, praise God for that. But more importantly, they had 25 students get baptized uh, throughout the week. Yeah. Yeah. And so as, as much as I'm ready to get rolling, check out this video that shows the baptisms from this week. How great this love Oh, it's closer than a brother This is love He died so I could live And He is good I say about it, my God is love. And I know my God is love. I know my God is love. This is enough to know. No, there have been years at life point where 25 baptisms would have been incredible. And now we've seen that in a week. And so we have so much to celebrate what God is doing uh, here and through life point. And um, man, if, if you have a student who is not participating in our, our student ministry, Pastor Nick and his team are doing an incredible job. Uh, and you got to get your kids there. You got to get them plugged in. All right, round two. <laughs> Round two. You guys are probably aware uh, that the Summer Olympics kicked off on Friday night with the opening ceremonies. And, and these festivities, right, they mark the official start of the Olympics. Now, prior to having the honor of riding down the Sign River on a boat representing their country, the majority of the athletes would have had to first complete or compete in uh, the Olympic trials. Now, the purpose of the trials are to test the athletes in order to determine who is the best, who rises to the top. And, of course, those who perform well during the trials are given a spot on their Olympic team. Now, the majority of us are never going to have to participate in anything like the Olympic trials, and I'm super grateful for that. I'm glad I don't have to run the 400-meter race or swim an endless amount of laps in a pool or ride my bike as fast as I can for miles and miles. I assure you it would not end well for me. Um, however, throughout our lives, we will all face trials of our own. And sure, they may not require that we're in the most peak physical condition, but they can be just as grueling and painful and exhausting as any of the trials the Olympic athletes experience. Scripture has a lot to say about the trials that we'll encounter throughout our lives, and we're going to be looking at a number of different passages this morning that talk about that. However, our primary focus will be on a passage in the book of Malachi, which happens to be the last book of the Old Testament, and it addresses not only trials, but it references fire 
as well. The past few weeks, we've been in this teaching series called Ablaze, and throughout the series, we've been studying biblical accounts that include fire. And our goal is to discover the truths we need to learn and the principles that we need to apply from these biblical stories that reference fire. So that being said, I invite you to open up your Bibles or navigate in your Bible app to Malachi chapter 2. Again, the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 2. And while you're finding your way there, allow me to provide you with some brief context for what's going on as we study this passage this morning. Now, as a result of their sin issues, the Israelites were defeated by foreign nations and taken as captives to the land of Babylon. And around 538 BC, the first exiles return to Jerusalem. About 22 years after that, after they've returned to the land of Israel, the people finished rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem that had been destroyed. Unfortunately, though, the zeal and spiritual fervor that drove them to rebuild the temple doesn't take long to wane. And when the book of Malachi is written, their worship had lapsed into mere routine. The people were complacent. They were indifferent which leads God to send a message to his people through the prophet Malachi. And so throughout the book of Malachi, we see this back and forth exchange throughout the entire book between God and the Israelites, which includes the complaints and accusations made by the Israelites, no surprise there, and God's response to their statements. And so we're going to be taking a closer look at one such exchange which begins in Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, which is the last uh, verse of that particular chapter. Follow along as I read. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or, where is the God of justice? Now, this particular exchange begins with the Israelites accusing God of being pleased with those who do evil and accusing God of failing to bring about justice. Now, you and I might hear that and think, it seems unwise to come at God like that, right? It seems unwise to accuse him of being in favor of those who do evil and being, uh, failing to bring about justice, one commentator writes, as justification for their misbehavior in marriage, because they had married foreigners, as justification for their misbehavior in marriage and divorce, Israel claimed that God had failed them by allowing evil around them. Therefore, Israel wearied the Lord, complaining that he approved of evil and was uncaring about justice. So why would they be obedient to him? You see, from the Israelites' perspective, God seemed to be indifferent to the sin issues of those around them. And so they used God's perceived indifference as justification for their own sinful behavior. In other words, they're essentially saying, if he doesn't care about what they're doing, he must not care about what we're doing. And so why would we respond in obedience? Why would we follow the rules? But when they're called out for their sin, what's going on in their own lives, they fail to address their issues and instead blame God or point fingers at other people and say, well, well what about them? They're doing the same things we are. In verse 17, the Israelites sound similar to how kids, not my kids of course, but just how kids respond when you call them out for doing something wrong. You ask them, well, why haven't you cleaned up your room? Well, if you hadn't bought me all these toys, my room wouldn't be messy. What? Right? Or like, you got to stop hitting your sibling. Leave your hands to yourself. Well, if you would do something about it, Dad, I wouldn't have to hit them. Like, okay. And similar to the responses of our kids, the accusations made by the Israelites aren't based on reality. And they fail to address the real issue, their own behavior, their own sin. 
we see how God responds starting in verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord who you are, you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Now this initial part of God's response answers the Israelites' question, where is the God of justice? Where is he? We don't see him. God answers this question. He explains that two messengers are coming. The first messenger who will prepare the way is the prophet Elijah. And Malachi makes that clear by specifically naming Elijah in chapter 4, verse 5. In the New Testament, this exact verse is also referenced when talking about how John the Baptist is going to pave the way for Jesus. And so there's this dual meaning or dual fulfillment in this particular verse. But then there's this second messenger. And the second messenger, referred to as the messenger of the covenant, is a reference to the Messiah, who you and I know as Jesus. And essentially, God says to the Israelites, you want to know where the God of justice is? Don't worry. He's on the way. And God goes on to tell the Israelites what the messenger, Jesus, will do when he arrives. Let's continue reading God's response, starting in verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Israelites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years." So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive aliens of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. You see, back in verse 17 of chapter 2, the Israelites had accused God of failing to bring about judgment on those who had sinned and to provide justice for the oppressed. But God makes it clear to the Israelites that the messenger is coming to do just that, to bring justice and judgment. However, the surprising news for the Israelites is that this judgment and justice isn't just for their enemies, those nations around them who are doing evil. It's for the Israelites as well. And in verse 2, the arrival of the messenger is referred to as the day of his coming. Most scholars understand this to be a reference to Jesus' second coming, when he will come back to the earth again. However, we don't know when that's going to be. In fact, Jesus himself doesn't know when that's going to happen. Mark chapter 13, verses 32 and 33 says, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. And scripture has plenty to say about the day of his coming and all that's going to take place when it does. But we don't have a time to do a deep dive on that particular topic this morning. But I do want to highlight the role that Jesus will play when he does return. Verse 2 says, he will be like a refiner's fire. And of course, this leads us to ask, well, what is a refiner's fire? A refiner's fire is where a material, usually some kind of metal, is placed in a fire that's hot enough to melt the material and burn away all the impurities. And once the impurities have been removed, a purer, more valuable version of the metal remains. And so, in, in the response to the Israelites, God describes Jesus as a refiner's fire because he knows that's exactly what the Israelites need to experience. The issues of the Israelites, their sin issues, are well documented throughout the Old Testament. The past two weeks, we've talked about their issues with complaining and rebellion. They are like a metal that is full of impurities. Therefore... They need to be refined. They need to go through the refiner's fire in order to be made clean and in order 
to be purified. Now, from that picture on the screen, you can probably tell that going through a refiner's fire would be an intense process due to the extremely high temperatures. I learned that a refiner's fire is typically between 1,600 and 1,800 degrees when working with lead, and that gold melts at 1,943 degrees. And once this metal is melted down, the impurities rise to the surface and can be scraped away until only the purest form of the metal remains. Now, the Israelites, they would have been familiar with this process. And so I'm sure that they weren't too eager to hear that they themselves had to go through the refiner's fire. But verse 3 says, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. And because of their familiarity to it, they knew it would likely be a less than pleasant experience for their impurities. Everything that wasn't pleasing to God to be burned away from their lives. Because as we previously mentioned, an unpleasant aspect of God's refiner's fire would include judgment for their sins. Verse 5 says, So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against the sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages who oppress the widows and the fatherless and deprive aliens of justice, but do not fear me. However, they also knew that whatever goes through the refiner's fire experiences transformation. And the result is far superior than the original condition of that metal. And this would have been true of the metals that go through the refiner's fire. And this will be true of the Israelites as well. And we see that in verses 3 and 4 of this passage, which says, Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord. Their significant sin issues that have hampered them for so long will be removed. And they will be made pure and holy. And and this would have been a difficult message for them to receive because of how they were living. It's probably one that they weren't really wanting to hear at the time. But ultimately, it is an encouraging and hopeful message. Why? Because the messenger, the Messiah, is coming as a refiner's fire and not a forest fire or an incinerator's fire fire. Pastor and theologian John Piper writes, a forest fire destroys indiscriminately. An incinerator consumes completely. But verse 6 says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. You are not destroyed. He goes on to write, a refiner's fire refines. It purifies It melts down the bar of silver and gold, separates out the impurities that ruin its value, burns them up, and leaves the silver and gold intact. The furnace of affliction in the family of God is always for refinement, never for destruction. You see, to say it another way, God wants to use the refiner's fire to bring about the Israelites' transformation and not destruction. And so perhaps you're wondering, well, well, that's great for them. But what does that have to do with us? After all, Malachi was written hundreds of years ago. It was addressed to a people that is not us. And so what does this have to do with us? Is this even relevant for our lives today? You see, well, first off, when Jesus comes back in the future, he won't just be a refiner's fire for the Israelites. He'll be a refiner's fire for us as well, meaning we will also experience the same purification process. And second, this is also very relevant for our lives because Jesus cares about our refinement, not just down the road, but today, here and now. 
He wants us to be sanctified, which is just the ongoing process of becoming more and more and more like Jesus. It's this process that begins the moment we put our faith and trust in Jesus for our salvation. And it continues on until we see Jesus face to face. And he makes us perfect when we're with him in heaven. And while we can be refined and sanctified in so many different ways, one of the primary ways that we become more like Jesus throughout our lives is the trials that we encounter. In other words, every trial that we experience to some degree can function as a refiner's fire, taking us through this process of transformation that results in our sanctification, us becoming more and more like Jesus. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. He writes, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These trials have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. See, Paul here reminds the Christians who received this letter that the trials that God brought to them the trials that they experienced in their lives. They had a purpose. It's to refine their faith, which is more valuable than gold, and it's to provide evidence that their faith is real. The book of Proverbs also references the refiner's fire and the transformation it brings. Proverbs 17, verse 3 says, The crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. We know that this testing often comes in the form of trials. Speaking about this verse, one commentator writes, the heat of hard times is designed to improve us, drawing us closer to the heart of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, Paul says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. In this same chapter, Paul goes on to say in verses 16 to 18, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that fars outweigh them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. After enduring incredible trials, the loss of all of his possessions and wealth, the tragic and untimely death of 10 kids, and his severe physical ailments, Job says this, when God has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Despite this unimaginable suffering, Job understood that troubles can achieve divine purposes if we allow them to. See, once we begin to, begin to understand that, just like Job did, and we begin to trust that the refiner's fire is ultimately for our benefit, we can begin to adopt this, the biblical author's perspective on and approach to trials. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish the wor its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You see, and the joy comes not so much in the difficulty and the pain 
and the grief and the suffering of the trial itself, but in the results that they bring, a mature and complete faith. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 5 shares a similar message. Paul writes, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. We all know that considering trials with joy and rejoicing in the midst of trials is certainly easier said than done. But when we begin to keep the end in mind, our perspective can begin to shift. Lois Tupi writes or talks about this in her book, Redemptive Compassion. Just a quick plug. One of our life groups this fall session is going to be studying redemptive compassion uh, as part of the fall session. And so I would encourage you as life groups kick off here in August, we're going to start taking signups. Be sure to check out that study as they're going to walk through redemptive compassion on Tuesday nights. But let me read this quote from her book. She writes, life is hard, but it's not all in vain. Challenges can become opportunities for growth if we embrace them rather than try to escape them. Everything in the Bible suggests that we are to persevere and become overcomers, not be overcome with hopelessness. Going through the trial is difficult, but we are called to use it as a time of training through which we should grow stronger. Emily Boffman is a member of our worship team here at LifePoint. In fact, she was just on stage a few minutes ago, and I'm going to invite Emily to come back up uh, so that she can share the story of a trial she experienced with you. Uh, Emily was asked about five minutes before the service began to... No, I'm just kidding. Um, That would be mean. Um, That would be mean. Uh, Emily, just like everybody else, you and Andy, your husband Andy, have gone through uh, so many trials throughout lives. It's, It's inevitable. It's just part of what life is about, but there is one particular trial that stands out. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Um, So about 12 years ago or so, uh, Andy and I were expecting our second child and um, had a very normal, healthy pregnancy. And um, our son, Micah, was born at Sutter Memorial. And we found out soon after he was delivered that he had something called duodenal atresia, which um, is a type of bowel obstruction, and he was going to require admission to the NICU and um, surgery. And like I said, it was a very uneventful pregnancy, so it was quite shocking um, to process that, uh, you know, when the NICU team was on standby during his delivery and kind of whisked him out of the room, um, we were pretty terrified and just a lot of unknown. We we didn't quite know what it was, what the prognosis was. Um, So we were kind of sent into a bit of a panic, Um, just really scared. He ended up staying for a total of 19 days in the NICU, had surgery when he was three days old. So yeah, I mean, every trial is unique. Uh, What what brings about or what causes it to be challenging, I can't imagine uh, having to see my kid go through surgery such so, so early on, and then spend that long in the NICU. Um, certainly those, those trials, if you will, the, the heat would have been quite hot as you guys went through your refiner's fire. So how did you respond? How did you guys get through that time, endure that period of time? Yeah, so as you can imagine, there was very little peace in those first few days, um, the peace I had known, just the peace of God that scripture talks about, I did not, I just have to be transparent, honest, I did not feel it. I was super scared. Um, some early examples, those first few days, Micah had a really hard time keeping his oxygen levels up, which is somewhat common. Um, you know, at three days old, seeing my teeny tiny baby um, wheel down to the OR was... Um, just unimaginable. Um, One scary moment the day after his surgery, he had come back on a ventilator and um, 
they had tried to take him off the ventilator and he failed that, mm -hmm. meaning uh, when they removed it, his airway collapsed and I just so happened to walk into his room at that moment and um, just, you can imagine just seeing his little bed just surrounded by doctors and nurses trying to open his airway back up and thankfully they were able to, but you know, that sticks with you. I was um, just sent into a panic and cried out to God like I never had before. Four. Um, my sweet husband, who's up in the control room this morning, we were back in my room uh, shortly after this happened, and he just encouraged me, Emily, <laughs> you know, in order to get any kind of peace in this situation, we need to really figure out how to surrender um, Micah's outcome to God. I was really met with the question, you know, I, I've believed in God my whole life, and it was like, Emily, do you really trust me? <laughs> do you really believe, um, you know, what you've proclaimed to believe your whole life? And you know, do I really trust that he is good, that he's working for my good? Um, and so I, I remember the moment so clearly. I hit the ground on my knees and obviously prayed for Micah's healing um, in that moment. But I can remember so clearly I just really prayed a prayer of surrender. Like, God, I'm choosing to trust you. I don't know what's going to happen with my baby, but I, I know that you are good. I know that your promises are true. I'm going to hold it as tight as I can to these promises and um, know that you're working for my good. Uh, it reminded me of Matthew 11. Jesus tells us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he says, take my yoke upon you. For my, uh, it's easy. My burden is light. He does not want us to carry these burdens, these anxieties on our own. We're not meant to do that. And um, one way he showed up so strongly in our lives was our church family at the time. Um, just really came around us and, you know, started meal trains and, I, you know, Micah was on a prayer chain for a long time, hundreds of people praying for him and for us. So they were really the hands and feet of Jesus. Yeah. We just talked about how, you know, the refiner's fire, we say it's meant to transform us and it's meant to, just, to strengthen us. But oftentimes when we're going through those trials, it feels like we're about to be destroyed. It feels like, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this. Um, it produces more questions than answers a lot of times. It produces more uh, fear than peace, as you kind of initially had experienced. So, so how then ultimately did you guys experience this transformation or this strengthening of your faith having gone through the refiner's fire there? Yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways it came from that initial surrender, you mm -hmm. know, just that that moment I was hit with, like, <laughs> I, have, I have choices here. I can choose to hold on to this control that I really have no control over, right? Or just take that step of faith and put my trust in the God that I've, I've believed in. And um, I never really felt the presence of God so strongly than in the halls of that NICU. Um, he showed up in just ways I can't even put into words. Um, I you know, that moment that I surrendered, he filled me with that peace that scripture talks about, you know, the peace that passes all understanding that I'm sure if you've experienced that, there's no way to even explain it, mm. to have any kind of peace, you know, sitting in this, in this NICU room, not really knowing what the outcome was going to be. Um, but he did, he showed up and, um, gave us that peace that was incredible. Um, you know, I, I would ask myself, I think we've probably all asked the question, like, why do bad things happen or, or why did God allow this? And I, I do not believe for a second God makes these bad things happen, um, but he does allow us to walk through them. And, and I feel like for me personally, um, my faith had never been stronger than in those moments of just taking that step of trust and... Um, you know, I also realize that I'm not really called to understand. We don't always get to understand this side of heaven, the big picture. Um, and, you know, scripture even says in Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Um, and like you preached a minute ago, you know, we're called to consider it pure joy when we face trials. And it's not easy. I know that. Yeah. It's not easy at all. But, yeah. yeah. Not, not easy. Certainly it's not something that you guys were expecting. It's not something you were hoping for. Physically, emotionally, spiritually exhausting. But you guys saw God's faithfulness through that process. How's Micah doing today? 
Yeah, so Micah is 12 years old and super healthy 12-year-old, uh, recovered really well, go, start in seventh grade next week. Um, he just got back from houseboats with the youth group, just did his very first trip with the youth group, and he's a smart, super witty, funny little kid, artistic, um, and just honestly like a walking testament to, yeah. to God's faithfulness and his goodness. Yeah, which is absolutely incredible. We know that's not the end of everyone's story. Um, and so to have you say he, he's a walking miracle, um, yeah, that's, that's absolutely amazing that God showed you guys that particular grace. But that's as if that weren't enough, right, getting to see your kid as this walking miracle. Um, he can, God continues to work in this same story 12 years later. This past Monday, you started a job. Where are you working? Okay. So, <laughs> 12 years ago, I became a stay-at-home mom and have spent the last 12 years being able to do that. It's been an incredible blessing. Um, my background is in nursing, and like six months or so ago, Andy and I kind of felt a prompting to kind of get my foot back in the door in the nursing world. And after months of applying to many different places, uh, there was one door that opened, and it was at the Sutter NICU. The same unit that Micah was in, yeah. So I got through it without crying. <laughs> it's just <laughs> pretty incredible how God has allowed me to see kind of a big picture that we don't always get to see. Um, you know, how he is working some of that stuff out for, for good and for his glory. Um, obviously, it's an incredible honor to go back to this unit and care for these patients and these families. Um, but I'm also struck, like, this story, it's nothing to do with me. It's nothing to do with Micah. It's amazing what God did, but it truly is a story. I mean, we anybody in this room could be up here sharing a trial. Um, and I know, like you said, the outcome doesn't, isn't always like what happened with Micah. Um, so it's not about Micah. It's not about me. But it, it truly is about God's goodness. He's faithful. He's with us uh, to carry us through. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Can we praise God for his faithfulness and for Emily Sharon? Thank you. We got some insight into Emily's story. Um, but the reality is I don't know your story. Man, I don't know what trials you've gone through. I don't know what trials you're going through right now or will be coming your way. It could be that you're experiencing infertility. You would love to have kids, but it just hasn't happened yet. You could be battling chronic illness. You would love to be 100%. You'd even take 75%. But what? It's just not happening. Healing hasn't come. And you continue to deal with the same issues every single day. You could be carrying the burden of a child who has gone astray. They've walked away from the faith. Or they've made decisions that have made life difficult. You could be going through a season of unemployment and facing the financial hardships that come with that. You'd love to go back to work but it's been closed door after closed door. And the trial you're facing could be relational. Things in your marriage aren't what you want them to be and you're barely hanging on. Or there's a friendship with someone that's been close and it's just withered away. We don't know what the future holds. But what we do know is that trials will come. The refiner's fire is inevitable. And so when they do come, what should we do in order to persevere? How do we endure? See, first we need to remember that God's purpose for our trials is refinement and not destruction. He has a plan and a purpose. He will not waste our pain. As Emily said, she referenced Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. The trials of the refiner's fire 
It will be uncomfortable, painful, and difficult. And in the moment, of course, they're not fun. But we need to remind ourselves that there's a purpose for our trials, that there is a purpose for the refiner's fire, and it's to bring about our transformation, our sanctification, to rid us of the impurities in our lives, everything that's not pleasing to God, so that we become more and more and more like Jesus. Second, if we're going to persevere, then we need to cling to God's promises. Multiple times throughout scripture, God tells us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. One such instance is found in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8, which says, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. We must also remember Jesus' promise to Paul when he faced a trial of his own. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12 says, But Jesus said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Meaning, we don't have to persevere on our own strength. In fact, we cannot. We will not be able to endure on our own. We have to rely every step of the way on the one who tells us my grace is sufficient for you. It's only through me that you will get through whatever trial is burning away the impurities in your life. You can't do it on your own. You have to rely on me. And just like the Lord was in the fire for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were thrown into the fiery furnace, You better believe that he will be with us through the refiner's fire as well. And last but not least, in order to endure whatever trial we're facing, we've got to be in community and not isolation. We need the support and encouragement of our church family. Emily was just up here talking about that. We need to put ourselves in a situation that allows our church family to help us carry and shoulder the burdens because that's what Jesus tells us to do. Now, I know that many of you have already made connections here. You've you've already done the work of building community for yourself and praise the Lord for that. But if you have yet to make that happen, then I would encourage you to be proactive and take steps to know and be known by others. The best way to do that is to join a life group, a small group. And it just so happens that sign up start next Sunday, right? Sign up start for our fall session of life groups where you can think through it through the entire month of August and figure out What group am I going to join? But if you don't yet have a group, you have to take that step. It doesn't just happen. Community is built. It requires work. It's an investment. And we all need that in order to endure the refiner's fire. Because when you find yourself going through that fire, you'll be so glad you've already surrounded yourself with community, people who know you and love you and care for you. James 1.12 says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Trials are never pleasant in the moment. But no matter how long we find ourselves going through the refiner's fire, my hope and prayer is that we will all persevere so that we can be among those that James calls blessed, those who receive the crown of life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are in need of you. God, we recognize that throughout our lives we're going to be 
going through so many trials, so many bumps in the road, some big, some small, but every step of the way, we're to rely on you. Because we have the Holy Spirit, God in us, and it's the only way we can make it. It's the only way we're gonna be able to persevere and cross the finish line. God, we walk through these things so that you can refine us, so that you can make us more like you. May that be our perspective. Remind us of that when we're in our darkest days, when we're going through the valley and we can't see anything else. You're there. You're walking through it with us. God, help us to cling to you. You'll never leave us or forsake us. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen.